Sweet. All right. So yeah, welcome to the presentation on um, electricals as of URC this year, 2022. Um, we've got there's a bit of pre-reading here on uh, the workshop on the CMDs and less important but also useful the uh, workshop on brushed and brushless motors. Um, if you haven't watched those yet, I'll try to explain some of the stuff. Uh, involved, but it would be worth going back to those afterwards to sort of get a bit more detail um, on some of the things you may have misunderstood or missed. Um, cool. Uh, so just as like a broad outline, uh, the arm has six rotary joints. Um, so there's the base rotation, uh, J1, the shoulder, J2, the elbow, J3, and then the three wrist motors. So J4 does pitch, J5 does yaw, and J6 does roll. Um, in addition to this, there's also the end effect of fingers, which, which close uh, linearly. And there's also a tiny linear actuator in the finger of the end effector, which we use for pressing buttons. Um, so that's all, they're all the actuators that we need to control. Um, so yeah. Um, a bit of detail on a single joint. We'll kind of come back to this repeatedly a little bit. So don't stress too much if you uh, don't understand. Um, but in for, so this is the elbow here. Um, essentially, we've got uh, on each joint, each of the rotary joints, we've got a Maxon motor, um, which drives uh, through the planetary gearbox, the cycloidal gearbox, and that turns the joint. Um, and the way that we drive the Maxon motor is using the CMD here, which is the CAN motor driver, um, which was in the workshop. Um, and to do, and then we've got two sensors on each joint as well. So there's an encoder on the back of the motor here. Um, this is on this joint here. It's the uh, AM. Uh, it's the encoder that comes with the maximum motor. So it's a easy 16 ENX or something. Um, and that tells us the velocity um, through quadrature signals. Um, and then there's also the resolver here, which gives us the position, the angular position of each joint. Um, and that's used in the inverse kinematics, uh, as you'll find out in a bit. Uh, any queries on this or this? Uh, I'm assuming you'll go into more detail about encoders and resolvers. So should I just wait until yeah. the dedicated yeah. section? Okay. Yeah, I think it's the next slide actually. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, at the moment, there's a few different uh, few different options for encoders and resolvers we use. Um, so on the base, uh, sorry, on the wrist, we use AMT tens. Um, which are the ones on the left there. Um, these have a pretty bad connector. It's just pin headers, particularly the axial version. Um, so we actually soldered direct, we've removed these. Actually, no, we haven't removed them, but we soldered directly to those pins um, to avoid using the connector. Um, we use these on the wrist because the encoders in the um, wrist motors that came with them, the Maxon ones died due to a bad power supply, very sadly. Um, so, yeah, we had to kind of hack off the back and install these because you can't replace the encoders, which is very annoying. A um, couple of notes. Um, it, we're thinking about switching to the, uh, sorry, this should say radial connector, not axial. Um, so that's the one on the left here. It's got a different connector. Um, so that might help, uh, means we don't have to solder directly to it. Um, so that's that's something we're considering this design cycle. Um, it is fast enough for the wrist motors. So encoders have a maximum RPM they can run at, and the wrist motors are really fast. They go up to twelve thousand RPM, um, which uh, typically a lot of encoders cap out at like eight thousand, or at least a lot of the AMT series do. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, and these output the raw A raw AB quadrature signals, so they're not line driven. Um, so line driven means that uh, you get a differential mirrored signal and that helps with noise immunity um, if you're running long traces. Um, so the AMT 11s, um, these are a potential option for the lower joints if we feel like replacing the uh, Maxon encoders due to the ribbon cables that keep sort of fraying. Um, these aren't fast enough for the wrist motor so we can't replace the wrist ones with these and they only go up to 8,000 RPM but they do have line driven uh, lines. So that helps with noise immunity on really long traces. Um, so we're considering using those on the lower joints. 
the third one here, this is the Maxon NX16 Easy. Um, this was on all six joints originally, but all the wrist ones are broken. Um, so we replaced them with AMG tens, as I said. Um, additionally, the ribbon cables are very fragile, particularly the connection to the um, encoder here. Um, and we have killed, we've broken one of them on one of the Maxon motors. Um, so we're, we now have no spares with an encoder. So we're in a bit of a tricky spot with that. Um, so one potential option is, again, we lop off the encoders and replace it with an AMT11. Um, that would be effectively a drop-in replacement because it has line drivers. Um, so the AMT11 would be pin for pin compatible. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the AMT21 resolvers. So these, we call them resolvers. Uh, they're also absolute encoders. Um, we, on the team, we tend to differentiate encoders that encoders do velocity and resolvers do position. It's not really a strict definition, but it helps with understanding. Um, so we use these, um, they're very affordable. They're about $80 each. Um, and these measure the absolute position. Um, you, you struggle to find uh, resolvers that can do better, uh, like similar accuracy to these at a similar price. Typically they're about $500 a unit, um, which gets very pricey when you multiply by six. Um, so yeah, these have an RS485 interface, um, which is sort of like a serial interface, but a bus architecture. Um, I'll note that on the lower joints, the mounts are quite good. There's still a little bit of improvement on those that we can do. Um, but the upper joints, they um, the mounts are quite quite poor at the moment, so we need some improvement to help the longevity of those. Like they they are they are cheap at eighty dollars, but eighty dollars is still a lot of money um, when you can be buying other things. So good to look after them. All right, any questions on encoders? Because that was a lot. Cool. Hopefully that's kind of clarified a few things. Um, we're also looking into magnetic encoders that use diametric magnets. Um, but I think I'll go into that a bit later. All right, um, so for sort of understanding how each of the joints, or each of the motors are sort of controlled, um, I've got a couple of slides on sort of the control systems involved. Um, so PWM control, as I call it, um, is essentially just uh, directly mapping the joystick inputs to the voltage of the motor. Um, so this is super easy to implement, um, but um, you can probably, there's probably, there might be an opportunity to try it out, but when you're driving it, there's sort of, you know, 80% of the movement of the joystick, or maybe say 50% of the movement of the joystick, the joint does nothing. And then you move it like 1% more and it'll move really, really quickly. Um, and then the rest of the, and then the rest of that, uh, like extra room doesn't really change the speed by a lot. Um, so it's really hard to make it move smoothly because it'll suddenly start moving at a slight movement. Um, so yeah, we, we basically want to avoid this, but we still do use this for the end effect of fingers because there's no um, sensing on those for velocity. Um, and that, that still works pretty well. Um, any uh, misunderstanding there? Cool. Um, so onto velocity control. Um, so all we've added on is um, that the joystick inputs now map to velocity, and we send velocities to the like velocity targets to the CMDs instead of voltages. Um, and what the CMDs do is at a thousand a thousand times a second, they will measure the velocity of the motor using the encoder, and update the PWM voltage. Uh, you know, push it up or push it down until it's at the correct velocity. So it does this with a PID loop if you've done control systems. Um, and this is remarkable. Uh, it's so much easier to control with this. Um, so velocity is now super smooth. So if you move the joystick 10% forward, it will drive at 10% of the speed within its range with some sort of buffers in there. And if you push it up to halfway, it'll actually drive at half the speed. Um, downsides are it's it requires encoders on every joint. Um, and not only that, it requires encoders with you know good connections. So if you have patchy connections to your encoders, um, you can suddenly have joints that are unresponsive or or behaving super erratically. They might move in the wrong direction or at maximum speed in the wrong direction or something like that. Um, and it's also a bit harder to implement um, because you've got to have, you know, you're going to have a bit of brains in your motor controller in order to do it. 
Um, so as I said, in each in this mode, each axis on the joystick corresponds to a specific joint and a velocity. So there's three jo there's two joysticks with three axes. So you know, forward, back, left, right, and twist, and each of those corresponds to uh, one of the six joints. Um, if the load and the target speed are too high, so say you're trying to lift like a five kilo weight with the arm and you want to drive it at the max speed, um, the motor won't have enough power to actually hit the target speed within its current limit. Um, so it'll it'll hit the current limit and then it'll sort of stop driving uh, to sort of to protect the motor. Um, so that's something to be aware of. If you're really pushing it uh, hard, you might run into issues where it doesn't move how you expect it to. Uh, all good on velocity control. Cool. Um, and now on to inverse kinematics. Um, so this isn't really a control system necessarily, but um, it's a way we control the arm. Um, and now instead of the joystick inputs corresponding to angular velocities of each joint, so like move shoulder forward, move base rotation left, um, this it now corresponds to Cartesian velocity. So it's basically move the end effector forward and it will move all of the joints uh, so it will move the shoulder forward, it will move the elbow to make the end effector move forward exactly how you want it to. Um, and that's the same with move left, move up, move down. And there's even modes about uh, like rotating around specific points. So it's quite it's quite cool. Um, I'm not going to be going into the details of how the IK works. Um, I think Jory's going to do a workshop on that in a later point. Um, but yeah, essentially how it works is, um, so again, we've got the joystick input mapped to Cartesian velocity. And then there's this box called inverse kinematics. And so this takes in the Cartesian velocities and it takes in the angles, the position angles of each joint. And some matrix maths happens and it spits out joint velocities. So like what we had with the joysticks before. Um, so then each of these joint velocities get distributed out to the six CMDs that are driving each of the joints. Um, and they do independent velocity control on their joints in order to hit the target joint velocities that they want. Um, yeah, so so like before, we have the encoder on the, on the motor, um, and so that is measuring the input velocity. Um, and then we've got this resolver, which which is on the output. So it's through all both gearboxes and measures on the output. The reason for that is if you, well, a a these are only single turn resolvers, and the motor like the the motor spins like three hundred times for every one rotation of the uh, output. So if you measured just the motor, you'd have to count how many times it spins. But in addition to that, um, you've got mechanical backlash and slop in your gearboxes, which will prevent you getting an accurate reading on the output based on the input position of the, of the shaft. So it's much, much better to have this measurement take place on the output, and then you actually know the true position of the joint. Um, yeah, and yeah, as a summary, basically, so all in, depending on what movement you're doing, all six joints will move together to 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 do what you want. So you tend to have a bit higher current draw, um, but the the control is super intuitive. Like if you want to just move the dress, move the end effector back, it just does exactly what you want it to do. You don't have to sort of okay, move shoulder, move elbow, move wrist down, and and figure it out in your own head. Does that make sense? Any any queries on all the control stuff? Sweet. Okay. Um, bit of detail on RS485. Um, so this is what we use to talk to the. Uh, this is the protocol we use to talk to the resolvers. Um, currently, we use the Jetson, which is the computer. Uh, the Jetson reads the RS485 bus using this USB RS485 transceiver. Um, if you just plug it in and like try reading the serial off it. Uh, by default, it's super slow. We can only do about five readings a second, um, which is like it works, but we would like it to be faster. Um, and this is due to some weird quirks with the USB uh, drivers for the one of the chips in in this, the the USB to serial chip in there. Um, so Lee and I have discovered some trickery to increase this to about fifty hertz, um, which is a lot better. Um, it's a little bit jank. There's sometimes it misses readings um, and stuff like that. So we're sort of trying to move away from it completely. Um, it's also worth noting that 
uh, like since RS485 is just a serial like standard, um, you, the, it is possible to just convert UART into RS485, so serial. Um, but this doesn't work because of some slow drivers on the on the Jetson uh, with serial. Um, there's a lot more details on the Nuquino article behind this link if you're interested, um, but it's kind of annoying. Um, but yeah, anyway, in, in short, the Jetson is not very good at reading RS485, no matter how you slice it. Um, so our new solution is to, uh, which is what Alex is developing, is to use a microcontroller that does all of the RS485 reading um, and then spits it onto the CAN bus, which we can read really quickly on the Jetson when we're using stuff with CAN. Um, so in theory, we should be able to hit at least 500 hertz on that. That's probably way too fast than we actually need because the IK loop, um, IK loop running at 50 hertz is probably fine. Um, Long-term solution, which we'll touch on a bit later, is possibly switching away from AMT21s. Um, but as I said before, they are very good value for money um, in terms of the other options. Uh, anyone got any questions about RS-485? Uh, yeah, does this mean we're um we're we're publishing like um joint positions only five times a second over ROS effectively? I believe that's correct. Yes. Oh, it, cool. it might even be less than that. I think it might be about once a second because it's it's five it's six joints at five hertz. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry, five there are there are only five. Well, I think we come to that in a minute, but there, there are only five resolvers on on the arm because there's not one on the end rotation due to. Uh, forgetting to do it or well, it was sort of implemented after we designed the wrist oh, fair enough cool thanks uh, but you're right it's very slow um okay on to all the circuit boards um so as i talked about briefly before um we've got the can can motor drivers um there's a full two-hour workshop on this on youtube already if you want to watch that um but these are motor drivers for brushed motors um they're quite modular they're very robust we've never killed one in uh, when it's been hooked up correctly. Um, and basically this just needs CAN bus. It needs a 12 volt input for the MOSFET drivers. It needs between six and 12 volts for the linear regulators um, that power all the, the microcontroller and everything. Um, and it's not there, but it also needs like battery voltage to power the motor itself. Um, so that's sort of the basic elements of what you need. Um, and, we'll, and we'll sort of tie all of these together in a minute. Um, the next board is the CMD carrier. Um, this is quite an old board. It was sort of designed at the same time as the CMDs. Um, and this is used for the lower three joints. So, so the base rotation, the shoulder and the elbow, um, because we only have sort of one CMD per joint in those spots. Um, a CMD mounts to this connector here on the, on the backside. Um, and we've got RS, uh, RJ45, so like Ethernet plugs coming in and out, um, which means we can daisy chain them up the arm. Um, there's the RS485 on this small connector in the middle here that plugs into the resolvers. Um, and oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. So RJ45 contains the CAN bus, the RS485 bus, and these two voltages, so 12 volts and pre-reg voltage. Um, and then the battery power in comes in in this power megafit connector here, and then motor power out goes out here. Um, these are currently megafit connectors. Um, we're looking at alternatives for these because they because they're right angles. They keep lifting out of the board eventually, um, because yeah, because there's nothing actually holding them to the PCB other than the pins at the back. Um, this connector here is an IDC connector, so like a ribbon cable. And that's what plugs into the uh, Maxon encoder, um, Maxon motor encoder. And at the back here, there's the pickup plate connector. And this, this has the RS485 lines and connects to the resolver. Um, this connector is annoying and small. Um, you can't, it's kind of a pain to, well, we don't crimp wires for it, but it's a pain to sort of make cables for. Um, and it's also really hard to plug in because it's in between these two big connectors. So um, if we're going to redesign it, that's something I'd change. Um, yeah, any questions about CMDs or the CMD carrier? Cool. All right. Um, the VREG board, um, this sits at the start of the daisy chain, um, of the Ethernet daisy chain. Um, it takes in battery voltage in this Sabre connector here, um, which is also something we, we want to change. Um, 
And it basically all it has is two buck converters on board that generate the, the 12 volt and the seven volt free rate voltage. Um, in future, we can remove, well, we, we're already doing this, but we can remove the seven volt one and just route 12 volts to both because the linear regs can handle 12 volts um, for their, like stepping it down. It's not too much power loss. Um, and yeah, it just injects these voltages into the ethernet wiring and then it goes up the arm in the daisy chain. Um, so it doesn't really do much of supreme importance. Well, it's very important, but it's not that interesting. Um, this guy here is called Tub, short for Tube Hub. Um, you might hear the people on the arm team call this Aristos. Um, you can tell them it's cringe. Uh, so that's good. Um, and this, this is for the wrist basically. So it holds all the end of all the CMDs for the wrist. So J456 and the end effector. Um, and this actually fits just inside the tube, um, of the upper so before the wrist. Um, and by just, I mean like literally by the skin of its teeth. So, um, that was a lucky coincidence basically. Um, but yeah, it works, it works quite well. Um, the, there's a small, there's a five volt buck converter at the end, um, which is used for the servos for the gimbal camera. Um, and there's also, and there's lots of connectors on here down the, down the end and up here. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but there's stuff going everywhere. Uh, next up is wrist break. So this is basically a breakout board for tub. Um, and you can see all of the motor connections and encoder connections and resolvers and fuses and gimbal cameras all plug in here. So yeah, we've got the four motor, motor connections, uh, actually five technically. So J456, the end effector clamping. And then this one here is for the linear actuator, this two pin one. Um, we've got connectors for the AMT10 encoders on the wrist. So these, these three all have five volts ground on the two quadrature lines. And then these two connectors here are for the AMT21 resolvers on the wrist. So there is only two. There's not one on the on the end rotation. Um, there's also some spots for fuses. Um, and Christos is very well designed in some some um, zip tie holes on here, so we can properly cable route everything. Um, and it's designed so that the the power connectors route sort of on top of the the, uh, the encoder connectors here so the vertical connector comes up and over the other one so it's pretty well designed in that respect um, because we had lots of issues with, with cable routing on the wrist um, which are mostly resolved but there's still it's, it's never it's never really going to be good um, so yeah this connects to tub through two ways it connects through this board to board connector here and this takes all of the motor power so the motor the motor currents are quite high so you need a, a reasonably beefy connector um, so all of the linear, uh, all of the uh, linear actuator and end effector and J four five six power comes through here, as well as I think it's five volts for the encoders and resolvers. Um, now everything else, so we've still got to get the RS Road five bus, the CAN bus for for the gimbal camera, and the quadrature lines back to tub, uh, back to tub somehow. Um, and that's done with this double ethernet port here. So um, it's a bit bit of an interesting design, um, but it does work. Um, so this double ethernet port contains the quadrature signals CAN and RS485, and it routes back to this one on, on TUB, and then all those traces run up to each of their respective CMDs or back out the ethernet connector for RS in the case of RS485 and CAN. Cool, um, so this is all of those boards in, one big diagram. So we've got uh, the rover juice link here, which is the front panel connectors on, on the rover. So that has the power for the arm, like the battery voltage, as well as the ethernet connector that has the CAN and RS-405 in it. Um, that battery voltage just gets passed up into the V-Rig board, all the CMDs and into tub at the back of tub. Um, and then we've got this daisy chain. So at first the, can, the ethernet cable only has CAN and RS-405 because that comes from the Jetson. Um, and then the, and then after the V-Reg board, it also has the 12 volts and the pre-reg voltage on there. Um, and these get daisy chained up through each of these boards all the way up to tub. As I mentioned before, tub has this five volt buck converter. Um, it's got the four CMDs and then it connects to wrist brake through this connector here. 
Um, and then we've got, as I said, this this double Ethernet, which is the gray line here with the encoder signals and RSO5 and CAM. Uh, any, anyone confused by that? All makes sense? Cool. I asked this question last time. Yeah. Um, and you answered it, just confirming I still remember the correct answer. Uh, the daisy chaining of the CAN bus, uh, that is, um, like, it, it's still actually just one wire for the bus, right? It, it's just that when you zoom out, it looks like it's going through each um, CMD, but but there is a continuous wire yeah. that. Yeah, so if you if you probe with, like, continuity uh, at the Jetson and at the end of tub, that would have the same connection to, to the CAN right. can low. It's not like uh, CM. Uh, it's not like CMD J two has to uh, take in the a CAM message and then spit it out to the Correct. to the next. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a bus okay. protocol. So there's there's basically you could you could imagine it uh, as there's like small little splices coming off the right. Bus. Yeah. Um, um, guys. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was going to ask about the gray line. So yep. does that connect to the blue line in terms of the RS-405 and CAN signals or does it yes. not? Yeah. So, okay. so the RS-405 and CAN um, go up to all the CMDs. Well, actually not the RS-405, the CAN does. And and the RS-405, and it also comes up to here only for the gimbal camera. Um, okay. The reason you can do this is because, so one thing you're going to be aware of, particularly at high speeds, is that CAN has a 30 centimeter stub length. So you've got like your main branch of your main like line of your CAN bus, and you can have up to 30 centimeters off the CAN bus where it will still function correctly. Um, if you go at really high speeds and you have really long stubs, you've got like reflections and stuff on the line and it'll cause signal integrity problems. Um, yep. Now, Zach? Sorry, can I just ask what is a buck converter? Uh, yeah, a buck converter is just a, like an efficient step down voltage converter. So this takes in the battery voltage and outputs five volts. Yep. So, all right. Um, oh yeah. Here's a bit more about the wiring. So, uh, sort of comparing daisy chaining and not daisy chaining. Um, so we've got lots of devices, but we don't want lots of wires. Um, so we use lots of bus protocols. Um, so CAN RS five five. Each of them have two wires, and they're shared between every device. So CAN connects to all the motor drivers, all the gimbal cameras, and RS five five connects to all of the resolvers. Um, in the, uh, and then, yeah, it all the messages have an ID which targets a specific board, um, or technically the devices, so in the CMD's case, the devices choose a list of IDs to listen to. Um, so CAN's quite a good protocol. It's got lots of redundancy, error checking and retransmission. So if, if nothing, if the message doesn't get through correctly, um, like if no one listens to the message, it will, um, it will retransmit until it does. Um, RS-485 is very basic in comparison. Uh, if it it can send the message and if nothing, if it gets garbled and it doesn't get interpreted correctly by the receiver, nothing happens. That's just it. Um, the only saving grace is that in the RS-485, um, if you uh, when it's when the resolver is transmitting back to the um, to the uh, the Jetson. Um, it'll have there's a checksum in the in the values, so if you can verify that it didn't get garbled on the way back, um, but it it won't retransmit if it's wrong. Um, just to confirm checksum, so yeah. um, can you can you evaluate? It's not evaluate. Can you expand like what they actually are? Uh, yep. Yeah. Hang on, I'll pull up the data sheet. Um, so. Um, it it varies depending on the device on how the checksum is implemented. Um, but in so in the encoders, they will send back. So you basically send this command here with um, like what's your position, and it will respond with the the first eight bits of the of the position, the next six uh, yeah six bits of the position for fourteen bit resolvers. And then two bits of checksum, so K0 and K1. And how these K0 and K1 are calculated is with this uh, lovely equation here. So it's like a bunch of bitwise fours and then the not. 
I think these are just these are just like parity bits. So if you count up the number of uh, ones and zeros in the number, it should give you the or if you count yeah if you count the number of ones in the odd bits and the number of ones in the even bits, it should be zero. I think I think that's how that works. Um, so um, yeah, so it'll oh you know it should equal the the parity bit. Mod, mod two, if that makes sense. So that was a bit garbled, but yeah, that's that's how it works. You can you can try writing a uh, code that solves it for you. Um, uh, so so these two bits they allow you to detect if a message has been uh, something some damage has happened, but yeah, does it have any information as to what the correct message is? No, it's not an error okay. correction code. It's just an error uh, checksum. So what would we even do with when we so uh, basically basically you use it to detect if it got messed up so that you don't think the arm is like ninety degrees from where it's been. So just ignore the ones where yeah you just ignore them or you could re you could re-request if it was failed right yeah cool all right um, all right and yeah so. Um, Ideally, we'd like daisy chain everything because it's kind of convenient to be able to, particularly when you're like doing all the wire routing, it's quite convenient to be able to just like run it from one board to the other board, um, which is what we do for CAN, RSRO5 and the 12 blocks. Um, the issue with it is that, that doing that introduces a lot of connect, uh, connection points that can cause issues. Um, so RJ45 is a pretty good connector, um, but particularly when it gets you know, moved around and unplugged and replugged a lot, and you know, crushed. Um, it can it can misbehave, um, but it so you, you there's always a trade off. Um, but it does enable quite easy disassembly of the arm uh, by just unplugging all the Ethernet cables. The problem is, and the reason we don't do this for the power is that it can't do high current easily. Um, you'd need really fat traces on all the PCBs to sort of daisy chain it through to get. All the current for the arm through each board. Um, so instead, for the power, we do one single, well, two two wires all the way up the arm with T splices at each joint. Um, luckily, we've only got to do, uh, I think it's three T splices uh, for the elbow and the both the shoulder, the shoulder and base rotation, and then it just plugs into uh, tub, and that's it. So it's not too bad. Um, but if you tried to do T splices for like the Ethernet ports, it would get ridiculous because you'd have to like strip it back and T splice all the eight wires inside, and it would get nightmarish. So that's why we don't do it for that. Um, cool. Back to the lower joints. Now that we've sort of uh, looked at all the parts, um, so we've got we use the larger Maxon motors on the lower joints, um, and these have the integrated MT10. Uh, sorry, integrated encoders, the Easy ENX 16s. Um, but these have fragile ribbon cables, which we've already damaged one on. Here we've got the AMT21 position sensor. So this output plate, so the, the core the core of the resolver here is relative to the input. So when the input rotates with that output, the angle changes, angle reported. Um, it's very important. It's, it's quite easy to sort of try and think of mounts for AMT21s that, uh, the, that actually don't measure the input because you've Mounted the, you've mounted the resolver and the shaft of the resolver on the same side of the joint. Um, so you've got to actually make sure you mount either the resolver or the shaft of the resolver on the input and the other one on the output. Sounds obvious, but I've seen many designs that don't do that. Um, so, yep. Yeah. And then uh, the CMD here is just mounted. Um, sadly, it's a zip tie here because the mount broke, but um, they're, they're mounted with these uh, mounts directly to the motor. Um, so that helps, it helps keep the ribbon cable short for the result, uh, encoder there. Um, and this is sort of how the connections work on the lower joints. So like I said, battery power in, can in, and then we've got encoder. Uh, so yeah, and then there's the motor, obviously. We've got five volts going to the encoder and the AB signals coming back for this velocity. Um, and then the resolver here, uh, RS4 at five and five volts in. And then the CMD plugs into the big connector here, which basically has CAN battery voltage and the encoder signals coming in. And um, 
the motor power, so the, the current that actually drives the motor coming back out, as well as five volts. So we use the linear regulator on the CMDs, uh, which gives us five volts to power both the encoder and the resolver. Um, so you can't like plug in a CMD shield and expect the resolver to work. You've got to plug in its corresponding CMD, otherwise it won't have power. Uh, any questions on that? Cool. Um, onto the wrist. Um, so these guys use, I don't really have a good photo, unfortunately, but these guys use the smaller Maxon motors. Um, they're actually mostly hidden inside tubes. So you can see like there's one inside the tube there. Uh, there's one inside the tube there and there's one inside the sort of clamp here for the uh, wrist. Um, as I said before, the integrated Maxon encoder has died. So we now use AMT10s and we can't use AMT11s because they spin too fast. Um, and then, yeah, there's, AM, uh, there's MT21 resolvers on J4 and 5. So you can see the one on the top there. Um, it's got this sort of 3D printed mount that is, so this is bolted to the input side and then the output side, um, the shaft spins inside the resolver. Um, there's another one on J4, which is behind the camera, but you can kind of see the mount there. Um, J6 doesn't have one because uh, adding resolvers was kind of an afterthought, and uh, there was there isn't a way feasibly to mount one on there because the end effect is in the way. Um, but with a redesign of the arm, that would certainly be something you'd want to do because it helps uh, it helps with IK basically. Um, you can do some more stuff with the wrist. Um, my main note on the wrist is that wire routing is critical. Um, it's an absolute pain in the ass <laughs> to be honest. Um, to you sort of got to route it up up these resolver mounts and, and stuff. It's just because there's so many moving parts in such a confined space, it's really difficult to A, have enough slack that everything can move freely and B, not have too much slack that wires get caught in stuff. And you've got to make sure it's all kind of tied up correctly. Um, so yeah, basically if you're sort of designing a new wrist, make sure you actually think about where your cables go. Um, ideally we'd have like, um, and we're sort of looking into this having hollow core gearboxes on uh, having like hollow spaces in each of the joints for wires to pass through so that they don't have to be routed on the outside they can go through the center and that would help a lot with um with keeping things neat um all right here's sort of the the big boy picture with everything in it um i probably won't go into too much detail but you can this mainly has all the connections for um wrist break so you've got as i said all the motor powers the resolver and the encoders, um, as well as the gimbal cam. And there's an additional gimbal cam connector on the back of tub, depending on how you want to route it. Um, so you can do either or. Um, cool, a bit about USB. Um, this is sort of a nightmare, to be honest. There's, there's a lot of competing opinions on the team about how USB should be done. Um, and um, it's a bit of a headache. We use it for the gimbal cam, uh, for all the cameras on the, on the arm, uh, for which most of them are on the end effector. Um, and getting getting it all up there in one piece is, can be tricky. Um, but yeah, basically, so there's a USB port on Juice Link, so next to the Ethernet port and the power for the, um, for the arm. Um, this routes up, basically all the way up the, the uh, lower section of the arm like the lower tube, out the end of the first tube, and then plugs into this USB hub, this inline hub. So you can see the green, the green wire basically comes out of the um, out of the shoulder, out of the elbow, and routes over to here. And then we've got this inline hub, which so this yellow cable here, um, and one which is only two ports. Uh, one port goes up to the gimbal camera here, which extends out this way, and the other one runs up to the end effector. And then on the back of the end effector here, we've got four a four port hub um, with right angle connectors. Um, and this has space for four cameras in URC or in ARC. I don't think it's in the new rules, but last year there was a there was an RFID tag that we had to scan. Um, so that replaced one of the ports. Although I don't actually think we had that hub at that point. So yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, there's we had issues with USB back before I joined the team actually um, in 2019 where uh, USB hubs kept dying randomly 
Um, it was probably due to bad voltage regulation somewhere, um, but it's meant we've been quite careful with it. Um, there's also like not many good USB connectors that are sort of easy to deal with. Like US, micro USB is bad. Mini USB is okay, but it can come loose. USB A itself um, is very easy for the cables to sort of come out. So you'll notice in a lot of places we just like tape. We if we've got to a USB A female to male connection, we just like tape it together with electrical tape. Um, USB C is an option, but um, it it's sort of hard to uh, like. It's just a lot of conductors in it. So anyway. Um, so yeah, they're the sort of decisions you get to make with USB. Uh, any questions about this stuff? Uh, not sure if you elaborated on this or wanted to elaborate on it, but why can we only choose USB connectors? Why can't we use an EP 2.5? Mm. Yeah, so um, the obvious thought is, oh yeah, just replace it with a different connector because USB A is huge. Um, but uh, USB, you probably, you may not have ever noticed, but in USB, there's, there's four pins, five volt ground and the two data lines. And in the USB port, they're sort of shaped it's sort of shaped like this. So the five volt and ground connect first, and then the, the data lines connect second. Um, and that's done very deliberately. It's part of the USB spec. Um, and if you don't follow that, your components may or probably will explode. Um, so there's not many connectors that have that feature. Um, EP 2.5 certainly don't. So if you wanted to switch your connectors, you would have to forfeit your hot plug ability. Um, and hope that nothing ever gets unplugged randomly, which is not going to happen. So, um, some, yeah, that's that's why we haven't like just like cut them all off and replaced them with something different. And do you have a question, Alex? Uh, yeah, um, this might be more fitted for the end, but can we uh, have a more closer look at Juice Link? I, I'm still not sure uh what we've got me, me, what it is exactly sure juice link juice yeah. link is a dumb name for some that it's a dumb <laughs> name that stems from 2018 probably um it's just it's just a name for all the panel mount connectors on the front of the river um it's sort of it's linking the juice from inside the river to outside the river <laughs> <basically>. <laughs> um, so uh we, we give things dumb names but if you look at the river right now on the front there's the panel mounts so the power, the Ethernet, the USB, um, that's Juice Link. Um. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So can I just pin my camera so that I can point oh, it yeah, at the robot? Right. Juice Link isn't a board. You were just saying it's just connectors. Yeah, it's just Panama connectors on an aluminium sheet. Okay. It's yeah, fun. I know those. Right. I never knew that was called Juice Link. I always wondered yeah. what the hell Juice Link was. That's Juice Link. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's also a Juice Link on the side for like the. It it's dumb. We've requested chassis to change the name of them, but no, it is the panel mount connectors. Well, I, I call them that. Anyway, oh, it's sort of a dumb joke at this point. That's like historically driven and juice. Yeah, cool. Um, making good making good paces isn't going as long as I thought it would. Um, I put in a bit of stuff about sort of our plans for the brushless arm stuff because um, I thought it might be interesting for some of you. Um, so this is what this sort of test rig looks like. Um, we're hoping, basically, we're hoping to design a gearbox that has hollow, a hollow center um, completely, and uses brushless motors um, and can do position sensing on the output. Um, so the challenge for that is, if you have your motor in the center of your gearbox, um, if you use AMT tens, you need your. Well, it's so okay. A A we're using motors with a hollow core. So essentially we'll mill out, we'll, we'll cut out the center part of this rig in the final gearbox. Um, so how do you then measure the speed of that? Uh, if you use an AMT 10 or 11, then you no longer have a hollow core because it has to couple to the back of the motor. Um, and you know you can't have wires going through because it'll spin too quickly and whatever attaches it will cut the wires in half basically. Um, so you can't use AMT 10s or 11s. And if you want to measure your output, you also need something on the output side, um, which is less important because the output only moves like once per revolution, obviously. So it's not as bad as the input, which is going to move 300 plus times per revolution. So how do you have a, uh, so you, 
in the worst case, we can put an AMT21 on the output, um, but we're thinking of alternative options. Um, so I'll go into a bit more detail. Um, actually, yeah. So basically, we're planning to use a magnetic encoder IC, which I've been testing over the last little bit, to measure the position of the rotor using the actual magnets on the rotor. Um, and that will help us with that'll enable brushless control if you've watched the brushless uh, workshop. Um, and to do the same on the output, we're hoping to use these large diameter um, mag uh, diametrically magnetized ring magnets um, that are on eBay. Um, we haven't got them yet, and we're not sure if it's going to work or be accurate enough, but we're going to wait and see. Um, essentially, we could use these in place of the AMT21s and have like a solid like 20 millimeter diameter hole through the middle of the gearbox. Um, so that would help a lot with the wire routing. And if we can replicate it on the wrist gearboxes, it'll help a ton with the wire routing uh, up there as well. Um, so yeah, as a bit of uh, explanation, the uh, for we're considering the option one is sort of input velocity control. So um, we use the magnetic encoder that's that's a sort of coupled to the motor. Um, and that gives us the rotor position that enables us to do brushless control. Um, and it also gives us the speed of the motor so we can do velocity control with that. Um, this is basically the same way that the CMDs do it. Um, so we're pretty confident it'll work if we needed to. The other option is what well, we're deeming output velocity control. So because we've got this magnetic encoder resolver chip on the output, we can also measure the velocity of the output of the joint as well. Um, now it's obviously going to be moving a lot slower, so the, the control loop might struggle a little bit. Um, but in theory, it should be able to compensate for backlash on the output, um, which would make control a lot easier, particularly with IK at the moment. Um, if you sort of a bit hard to explain, but uh, depending on how the arms loaded up, if you start, if you move it up and then back, because of the backlash in the joint, it can not quite move linearly um, how you'd expect it to. And that's because basically the motor has to sort of spin up the gearbox in the other direction um, before it starts moving again. Um, so this should uh, hopefully fix that issue somewhat. Um, potentially we can implement position control because we'll have the position of the output as well. Um, now this is sort of less useful for our arm because it kind of makes more intuitive sense to move it with velocities, but um, it just enables, uh, because we're already doing brushless control, it, it's not too much harder, really. Um, and it enables sort of more fancy control schemes if we want to in future, which we currently basically can't do with the current arm because the resolvers are too slow. And yeah, that's basically it. So we're still, still to figure out if this magnet idea is going to work for the output. If it doesn't, then we'll probably just switch back to AMT21s and sort of Put them in the core but have enough space to get the wires through and around them um but yeah we'll wait and see i suppose um, but it should be cool um, sorry well can you say again like how, so the magnets the what's the idea behind the magnets again so they're going to be used for on the output for positional um information is that correct or yeah so um these these i the ic's which if you look up ma302 that'll give you the data sheet um but Basically, they they can do both position and velocity um, quite easily. So over SPI, you can request the position that they're at. Um, but they can also sort of, and, and they do that by just like measuring the direction of the magnetic field um, over them. Um, you can also get the quadrature, so they can interpolate the position on chip and translate that into quadrature signals, so that AB and index pulse signals. Um, so we can use those for velocity for the velocity control of the output if if that works. Um, so there's a few options there that we can we can try, um, but they're quite flexible. They're they're quite quite amazing actually how well well how how well the data sheet makes them seem. Um, but when you start when you start doing things off axis, so both the rotor here and the ma magnet here, you have to do a calibration on it, um, and the calibration. Is a little bit for the for the rotor. It's been a bit 50 50. I'm hoping for the magnets it'll be more accurate because they're a single piece magnet. Uh, I think the the small variations in this in the fields of each of these magnets is causing us issues. But 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, all that information will be out of date in like a month. So if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, who knows? <laughs> maybe, maybe you're watching this wondering how we did the brushed arm back in 2020. Uh, cool. Um, anyway, so yeah, it's kind of an abrupt end, but um, does anyone have any questions on all the brushless stuff or literally anything? Um, that I know there's a I lot. Have, I have like a bit of a dumb question. Um, I don't no, really no. like, I just don't really know how like, the resolvers and encoders are like physically mounted and how they actually know how fast the um, motors are spinning. Yep. So um, yeah. sort of hard to show you the encoders because they're all covered up with the these, these plastic things. Um, but basically the the like main part, okay, I'll just I'll go back to the encoder slide. So for, for these encoders, the main part, like the body of the encoder is attached to like the motor itself. And then this central colored bit is is attached to the shaft of the of the motor. So when yeah, the motor spins, sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, like the encoder on the back of the motors, right? Yep. Yep. So, so how the do shaft they, extends how... all the way out the back. Oh, so the shaft, it goes out the back and the front? Is that what you're yep. saying? Yeah, it only goes out the back a little bit. Right. Um, and... Uh, for example, on the on the wheel motor, yeah, on the wheel motors currently, we have like these little extenders on right. the shaft to make it couple better. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair question. Is uh, a okay. one of the wrist motors? You've got like cool. the encoder on the back side. You've got the actual yeah. motor here, and the motor's shaft goes back to the encoder as well as into the gearbox, which is this section. Right. I didn't realize that the, the shaft extended out, out the shaft. back. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah, I was like, "How the hell is it you coupled? Can, like, where is the?" You shaft? can te technically put it in between the motor and the gearbox, which is what Deluke is currently doing with the uh, new drive motors. Um, it's the same shaft; doesn't have to go the other way. Um, you just have to somehow embed an encoder between the motor and gearbox, which is structurally tricky. But yeah, it doesn't matter where you read it from. Cool. Um, another note: the the these ENX sixteen easy encoders; these are actually magnetic encoders as well. So. Um, these don't physically couple to the motor at all, but there's a small, there's a tiny diametric magnet on the back of the shaft that spins, uh, that spins facing this, and this measures the orientation of the magnetic field and converts that to quadrature signals as well. So that's basically what we'd be replicating on the brushless arm. Um, Have but you also, looked at what chip that is? Uh, it's I've tried to find it. It's it's secret. Ah oh, damn. Yeah. Um, but we can just make our own. It, it it's surprisingly similar performance to the uh, MA302, but they were released after the Maxons we bought. So it's definitely not the same thing. Um, and yeah, to continue on your, with your question, uh, Harrison, the resolvers are mounted. So yeah, so there's this one here on the wrist. So uh, this this top part of the, of the wrist here basically extends up. There's a shaft that goes through the center of the resolver. And then this plastic part attaches to to this part here, so so when when the wrist are yours left and right, the shaft moves within the resolver. Yep, and then for the lower joints um, here, it's the same thing. So when when the output spins, it spins this shaft inside the the resolver. So there's a there's a little like hook that comes in with with the off the input uh, mm -hmm. off the output shaft there. Cool, that makes sense. Sweet. Uh, any oh, other? So the yep. So the resolver is uh, stationary relative to the input side of the gearbox, and the output side has that little, yeah, that that little uh, hook thing. Yep. That's uh, yeah. right. That's correct. Now there's there's no reason you have to do it that way. That's just how it worked out. Um, mm -hmm. You can definitely do it the other way if you want to. Right. Um, so you could have. You could have had the body of the resolver uh, stationary relative to that hook thing, and the the center of it, I don't know, connected to a shaft that somehow goes through to the other side. Correct. Yeah. 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 But the the only reason you wouldn't is because the cable to the resolver has to connect to the CMD, and that's on the input side. So that's sort of why you would do it that way. Um, but on the like on the wrist, for example, uh, where am I? On the wrist, like the CMD is all the way back here. So like. If you if you wanted to do it the other way, like the wire routing is a nightmare either way, basically. So um, you, you could. 
Um, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Dumb questions. Welcome. Even, uh, even uh, yeah. Will there be a workshop on Cassie Electronics? Uh, probably. Although they're, you, yeah, they're not very complicated in comparison to the ARM. Um, particularly once you've covered the Jetson carrier, which I've already done. Um, so yeah. But I, yeah, it'd be a shorty. I probably could. I'll, yeah. Um, do you have any other notes, Christos? <laughs> Not pretty comprehensive. Yeah, I think so. Cool. Um, yeah, any final questions? All right, we'll wrap it up there.